Well, good morning. Welcome to Riceville Valley Community Church. This is our virtual service for April 19th, 2020, uh, as we continue moving through uh, really uh, kind of an interesting season in our world, uh, COVID-19. And what I wanted to do this morning is just draw us into worship. This is always that great challenge. I've said it in, in, in worship services past, um, but it is that place of moving our heads from looking at a screen to I'm going to worship God now. And so what I want to do is I'm going to give us a little moment of silence before we go into the call to worship this morning. And I just want to invite you, whatever way you need to ask the Lord to help you to do that this morning, to just focus your heart and your mind on what He has for you this morning. And then we're going to put a call to worship on the screen, and it's going to be a call and response. So you're going to be uh, you're going to have the opportunity to respond. And I would encourage you, do it literal word. Just bring yourself into that place of prayer this morning. So let's go to him right now, and let's just focus our hearts and minds on, on the Lord this morning. So Heavenly Father, as, as we draw uh, towards you with our minds and with our hearts, um, Lord, just in this moment of silence, would you just clear everything that needs to get cleared out so that we can put all of our focus and attention on you. And we're going to do that in our own words right now, Lord. So would you hear now our silent prayers of drawing towards you? Amen. Friends, would you be called to worship this morning? We are people of the 21st century, far removed from the upper room. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We've put away the festive trumpets, the fancy clothes, the chocolate bunnies of Easter Sunday. Must the message of Easter be put away for another year? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We still seek the one who offers victory over death whose love conquers evil. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We gather to worship the risen Christ who offers us new life. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Heavenly Father, here we are, those who have not seen yet have come to believe. We ask that this morning, you would bless us, that you would draw us close to you, that you would help us to just embrace this message of Easter, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, that we have life in him eternal and everlasting, that he's our Lord, our God, and our Savior. Lord, we pray that the message of Easter would be just as fresh this morning as it was a week ago, and that it would be fresh every week to come. And we ask that as we pray, as we worship, as we open your word, God, that you would Allow your spirit to be present with, with myself here, with each of us in our own spaces as we're listening. And Lord, that you would draw us deep within your purpose and within your will for each one of us this morning. Help us to see you, to know you, and to worship you. It's in Christ's name that we pray this. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, every Sunday we take this opportunity. It's this rhythm uh, of, of confession. It's this beautiful place of, in worship, I believe, that uh, as a believer, um, we're called to engage constantly. Not because Jesus Christ hasn't forgiven us completely, but it's because of what sin can do in our lives, what unconfessed sin does. And so every week we get into this rhythm where we make sure we come to the Lord and we say, hey, this is where I've fallen short this week, and I just want to be honest with you. And then we take that opportunity to confess in a, in a prayer of unity with each other. And so let us draw to the Lord right now. Let us ha just take that wonderful, beautiful opportunity to just clear the slate with him. And just, you know, it's almost like that, if you have a relationship with anybody, you don't want anything between you. And so you bring it out into the open to talk about it. That's what we're going to do right now with the Lord. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you yet again and ask that just in your goodness and your mercy, we would have the confidence to bring to you those places where we've fallen short in following you this week, where we've fallen short in living up to your word, where we've fallen short in our relationship with you and being faithful 
to hold you as the Lord of our lives. Would you hear now our silent prayers of confession? And now let's join together in the confession that we're going to put up here on the screen. Lord Jesus Christ, sin is my malady, my monster, my foe, my viper, born in my birth, alive in my life, strong in my character, dominating my faculties, following me as a shadow, intermingling with my every thought, my chain that holds me captive. Yet your compassions yearn over me. Your heart hastens to my rescue. Your love endured my curse. Your mercy bore my justice. Let me walk in humility, bathed in your blood, tender of conscience, living in triumph as an heir of salvation through your blessed name. Amen. Amen. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel that, you know, there is no doubt every single day we struggle with our humanity, we struggle with sin, we struggle with what it means to live in a fallen world. And Jesus has said, I know, I know, and I've conquered all of it. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's continue in prayer this morning with, with just the prayers of the people. Lord Jesus it is in that freedom now that we come, that we confess that you are Lord, you are Lord, that we give you the prayers of our community. Lord, I want to lift up to you just uh, those, those different folks um, that, that, that at least I'm aware of and create some space uh, just for others to pray into. Um, Father, first and foremost, I want to lift up to you just each family, each individual that is a part of this congregation and a part of this viewing community. I feel like we, we're starting to have just a bigger community um, throughout uh, our virtual service here. Lord, I lift up each one of us in this season of COVID-19. Um, every week I find that just at least in our family, we progress to a different stage of kind of where we're at in the struggle. And Lord, wherever each one of us are, I pray your presence would be fresh this week. Um, Lord, would you renew that, that for each one of us to know that you walk with us in this struggle. Father, I pray for, for, for those who have lost their jobs and are trying to figure out, you know, what am I supposed to be doing with my time right now? Lord, I pray for just a fresh understanding of, of what you have for those individuals. And I pray that you would, you would care for those um, whose income has, has been lost in this time. Lord, we pray that they would... They would want for nothing. And, and I pray for our community to be strong in seeing that and understanding that. Um, Heavenly Father, uh, we lift up those who are medical workers in our country right now, who are really are on the front lines uh, and, and are trying to do so much, and they do it self-sacrificially. Um, Lord, bless them and walk with them and keep them safe. Um, Heavenly Father, we also lift up those uh, who are charged with taking your gospel into the world and who are trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, Lord, we give you each of our missionaries and just pray that you would bless them and that this would, that would not stop the gospel from moving forward. But Lord, we also bring it right into home. Um, I know one of our blessings, Lord, is, has been just getting to know our neighbors better and, uh, and just finding out how amazing they really are. And Lord, I pray that blessing for each one of us that whatever... Uh, capacity we have to just love our neighbors, um, our literal neighbors. And for us, it's talking over the fence. Um, Lord, I pray that for each one of us, that you would help us to get to know and to love our neighbors well right now in the season. Um, help us to know what we can do in our communities. And Lord, we lift up our communities to you. We lift up those who are trying to do really hard things. I think of Swannanoa Valley Christian Ministries and the challenge they have to feed uh, to feed our community. And Mana Food Bank, is, is they have huge needs right now. Lord, we pray that uh, you would provide for those needs. Lord, we pray for, for all those who are being tasked with just more than, than they've ever thought they could handle. And I just, I, I, <laughs> I ask that they would find over and over that your goodness is 
bigger than the challenge and that they would just see over and over that, wow, the oil has not run out. Uh, How is this possible that we still have enough? Lord, please provide. And Lord, I just give space right now for those who, who have individuals, who have family, who have friends who are struggling right now that need prayer. Lord, would you hear now our silent prayer? Lord, we conclude this by praying the way that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, friends, as, as we prepare to look at the Word this morning, um, we're in the lectionary uh, still as we're in the Easter season, and I continue, I just, I say this, I feel like I do say this every week, I, I, I just continue to be amazed by how much uh, the lectionary seems to be so applicable to this place that we're in right now, and we're in the second week of Easter, according to the lectionary, and um and the title of, of the sermon this morning is, What is the Bible Trying to Tell Us? <laughs> what is the Bible trying to tell us? Uh, I, I have a, a variety of relationships in my life where I sometimes wonder, what are they trying to really tell me? Well, what's the Bible really trying to tell us? Uh, and it's easy, I think, when we read the Bible to feel like the message of the Bible is to be good people, right? It's, the Bible's trying to make us into good people. Uh, I had a this experience recently, um, I was at my in-law's house. We were all over there for dinner, and my father-in-law put out this amazing hors d'oeuvre plate, of which he often does, and is, he's an incredible cook in his own right. And he put this plate out, and on the plate, there was all these wonderful things, but, but he put out some of those little pieces of smoked salmon. You, you know what I'm talking about? They're, oh, they're so good. And my son, who really embraces his role in this world as an omnivore, uh, especially the meat-eating side of being an omnivore, he tries anything and everything. And he looks and sees those, and, and uh, he sees me take a bite of one, and I enjoy it. And he, he says, Dada, can I have one of those? I said, of course, buddy, of course. And, and so I, I get one, and I hand it to him, and he puts it right in his mouth, and it mm, maybe a second, and then boop, pops right back out of his mouth, and that little face happens, and he you know, just did not like it at all. And here I'm thinking, oh, so good. And, and my little guy's like, it's not. And I asked him, did you not like that? And he said, oh, 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 no, no, no. And he wants a drink of water. It just Whatever it was, not good. And I guess you could say that our definition of good was very different in that moment. And, and yet, <clears throat> I find that kind of interesting because I don't think there's a language in this world that doesn't have a word for good. You pick your language. It, it, there's a million words for good. You know, be in gut tov, uh, how bueno, whatever your language is, there's a word for good. And yet, is there any word that is more subjective than the word good? I mean, it, it, it just... Think about it, it, that it can be subjective from culture to culture, but it can be subjective from person to person. And even within a, a person, it can be subjective from time to time. You know, I bet in a few years, my little guy, he's going to like smoked salmon. <laughs> I bet he will. And uh, what's going to change about him? His culture, his person? No, nothing. Just time. Time will change his definition of what is good. And so think about that for a minute. We can't even decide on what's good food, let alone the concept of what is a good person. But as it turns out, when we open our Bibles, I think sometimes we read it thinking it will make us a good person. And yet that is not the aim of Scripture. Not at all. The Bible does not aim to make good people. It aims to make faithful 
we're going to see that in our scriptures this morning. We're going to be looking at John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. And then later I'm going to bring in our Old Testament text, um, parts of Psalm 16. So if you want to mark that spot in your Bible, if you've got your Bible, go ahead and find Psalm 16 real quick, because I'm just going to be pulling different verses out of it. Um, But this morning we're going to start with just looking at that. What does it mean that the Bible is creating faithful people and we're going to look at the, the account of, of Thomas uh, in John chapter 20. So uh, I'm going to open this up. We're going to put John chapter 20 on the screen for you if you want to follow along that way. You're welcome to follow along in your own Bible. We're, we're reading from the ESV version, the English Standard Version this morning. And once again, John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. This is more than we can handle and yet enough for today. And so I ask, God, that you would give us enough for today. Um, Lord, would you bless the words I speak? Uh, If they are not from you, then I pray that they would just blow away like chaff in the wind. But if they are from you, would they find a place to rest in our hearts this morning so that we too could grow in faith this morning. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, there's a whole section in our hymnal. There's multiple sections. If you've ever taken the time to look at your hymnal, there's, the songs are categorized by set sections. Like, for instance, there's a section called Resurrection Songs, and it's songs that we sing around Easter time, and it's where we get some of our favorite Easter songs. Well, a good bit past this place in the, bio, in the, in the hymnal is a, a section called New Life in Christ. There are a lot of popular songs in that area. Songs like, I will sing of my Redeemer, and I I love to tell the story, and perhaps the most famous, Amazing Grace, right? There's another song in that section that I really like, and it's just a simple title, uh, hymn number 511. It's called Satisfied. I want to read you a couple verses from that, that hymn this morning. They are powerful. Listen to this, listen to this. All my life I had panted, For a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Let me read verse 3 to you. Poor I was and sought for riches, something that would satisfy. But the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul's sad cry. But then there's the refrain. And the refrain is so powerful. Listen. Hallelujah, I have found him, whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood. I now am saved. This to me is a Thomas song. Why? Well, partly because I'm not a really big fan of the whole moniker Doubting Thomas. I I, I see where it comes from, and I, I get it. Uh, but I think there's something more to Thomas than, than just the doubting part to him. Obviously he doubts. But I think there's something more because for me this is a guy who refuses to accept anything but the real thing. 
for those of you old enough to remember that old Coca-Cola uh, commercial, the real thing, it was their, their slogan for a long time. Well, Thomas is, is kind of a real thing kind of guy. He wants nothing apart but the real Lord. Nothing else is good enough. And for me, that's enviable. It really is. Um, because it's easy for our hearts to settle on so much less, isn't it? I mean, I, I think uh, I, my heart battles constantly with fleeting joys or instant gratification. Just, just to be satisfied with just a little something over here and that's good enough. And, and I'll just take that. But, but for Thomas... The real Lord is, is all he'll settle for. And so when the disciples come to him and they say in verse 25, we've seen the Lord. For Thomas, they could say whatever they want. But until he's seen the Lord, as he says in his own words, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Right? It's, it's kind of, to use this hymn, it, it's, it's as if he's saying, until I find him, the one my soul so long has craved, I'm not going to believe because <laughs> I haven't found him. And boy, doesn't that set the scene for our scripture this morning, right? Because we have verse 26. It says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And I just love this moment because I try to imagine it. And, and it's just, you know, what else do you say when you appear out of nowhere in the middle of the room, but, but peace be with you, right? I just imagine Jesus kind of, peace be with you. In other words, everybody calm down. Everybody's looking around like, oh, my goodness, Jesus is right in the middle of the room. And he's like, well, I didn't know what else to do. You locked the front door, by the way. Um, but, but he comes in, he says, peace be with you. And, and after everybody's like, whoa, 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 okay, <laughs> there's Jesus standing here. I kind of imagine it like uh, if you've ever watched a show and the camera's panning around the room and all of a sudden it settles on this one person. And that entire time, this one person has had their eyes fixed in one direction. I think that's what this moment is like. Jesus has his eyes. He walks in. He says, peace be with you. And once everything calms down, he has not taken his gaze off of Thomas the entire time. And he begins to walk straight towards Thomas with, with a, an honest joy and compassion. The same way that the shepherd has walked in and he says, there's an injured sheep among us and I've got to take care of it first. And he goes straight to the wounded sheep. And he does what honestly so often Jesus does for each one of us. He meets us right where we are, doesn't he? He meets us in our doubts. He meets us in our woundedness, in our brokenness. He meets us in our hope, in our, in our longing. And he goes straight to Thomas, the wounded sheep. And he says, Thomas, put your hand right here. Now, Jesus wasn't there the day that Thomas made his grand declaration, but, but he knows exactly what's on the heart of Thomas. And so he says, Thomas, put your hand right here. He says, Thomas, put your hand right here. And in this moment, something amazing happens. <laughs> he says, do not disbelieve. Jesus gives Thomas this invitation for faith. Do you see what he does there? Do not disbelieve, but believe. What does he want more than anything for Thomas? He wants him to believe. He wants him to have that faith. And I think Thomas could have replied with the very words of that song, satisfied, hallelujah. I found him, the one my soul so long has craved but Thomas understands this even at a deeper level than that, than the, than the craving of his heart. Because he does respond with real faith. He says, my Lord, but he doesn't just stop there. He said my Lord multiple times, no doubt. They've called Jesus Lord multiple times. But he says something else to it, doesn't he? 
he says, and my God. That's new. That's faith. That's Christ building that faith in Thomas. <clears throat> well, Jesus says something right after that that's quite, quite significant. He, he asks a question. He says, have you believed because you've seen me? Well, I think it's easy to read that question as if like maybe he's kind of pushing back a little on Thomas and um, maybe kind of like he's, he's guilting them a little bit. But really, it's more of a rhetorical statement or a rhetorical question. Uh, you could maybe even read it like, um, and right now, uh, you have faith because you've seen me, right? And of which everybody in the room would have been like, yeah, yeah, uh, we do see you, Jesus, and we have faith. Uh, and he says something right after that, though. And, and I believe that the statement he makes next is one of those kind of uh, eternal statements. It's a statement that's not just for these guys here in the room. It's a statement that's being spoken into all of humanity throughout eternity. It's for you, and it's for me, and it's for anybody who will hear it this moment forward. Undoubtedly, you all are believing because you've seen me, right? Yeah, yeah, Jesus. But then he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's one of the few beatitudes in all of John, you know, one of those blessed are statements. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Why does he say this? I believe he says this because he is making this declaration that just as blessed as Thomas is in this moment, this incredible moment that Thomas has experienced, and it is incredible. We have to see that. This is an incredible moment for Thomas. It is, hallelujah, I have found him, the one my soul so long has craved. And Jesus is saying, and anybody who ever believes without having this moment that you get to have, Thomas, is just as blessed as you are. They can just as easily confess, my Lord and my God. Now, that can be a little hard to believe, right? That, that statement is for you and I this morning. That we are just as blessed as Thomas is. I, 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 I find it a little hard. I mean, I think it's quite amazing that Thomas got to touch the resurrected Christ, Right? And yet Jesus is telling us the blessing is not this part here. The blessing is the faith. The blessing is you're coming to believe. And, and the truth is, is that's something that John has been telling us for about 20 chapters. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole message of what he's been doing. Listen to this. He wants you to know that. He says it in verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but get this, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Why has John written any of this? Because he wants you to have that Thomas moment, that my Lord, my God, that through these words you will believe, that you will have faith. It, in such a short space, John really defines what all of Scripture is doing, doesn't he? It's so that you'll have faith. That's what it's written for. It's not to make you a good person, though holiness will come, won't it? I mean, you can't believe this and not be in that pursuit of holiness, as, as A.W. Tozer would call it. That will come. But that pursuit of holiness, that pursuit of goodness, that pursuit of righteousness without the faith and without the relationship, without the Jesus part, is nothing. It's as Solomon would describe in Ecclesiastes, a chasing after the wind. It's nothing. It's just one more thing we go after. If you don't get the Savior in the process, if you don't get the Lord, the Master in the process, why does, what is the aim of Scripture? It is to create 
faithful people, people who pursue Jesus with everything they have. And this is what I love about this Old Testament text um, for today, Psalm 16. Listen to how, how this starts off. It says, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. <laughs> I have no good apart from you. Now for those of you who, who, who are kind of theology buffs, you like those big chewy meaty theology statements of Scripture. This is a really big chewy theology statement in Scripture. I have no good apart from you. We could do a word study on what good is right here and just kind of look all throughout Scripture. But, but in short, what is happening here is the Bible's definition of goodness is tied to the relationship we have with God. In other words, the only thing that is good within us is our relationship with God. We have no goodness apart from that which God bestows upon us. And we know this, right? We know that bec you know, because of the fallenness of humanity, we're always struggling with sin. We said that in our confession this morning, right? That, that the very, let me, I just want to look at this real quick and be reminded of some of these words because this is a powerful confession. Um, sin is my malady, my monster, my foe, my viper, born in my birth, alive in my life, strong in my character, right? In other words, to be human is to have to fight with sin every single day. Why is there no goodness within us in our own accord? Well, because without Christ, all we have left is sin, right? It's a, it's a pretty simple concept from there. And so to say something like, well, but I'm a good person, woo, I'll, get, I'll go back to the very beginning of the sermon. How do we decide what is good? We can't even decide on good food, let alone a good person. And yet, here Scripture comes in and says, goodness is not defined by the person, but by the Savior who guides and builds faith in that person. Secular humanism teaches us that if we just tap into the real potential of humanity, you know, if we dig deep enough, finally, one of these days, we'll finally be that good person we really can be. You know, that's taught in a lot of worldviews that I'm not going to go into right here. But we've seen it over and over and over that they fail. Why is that? Is that because we just haven't got the right formula yet to finally get everybody to be good to each other and not be self-seeking and, and not want for yourself constantly? No. No. Because at the core of humanity, we are selfish. At the core of humanity, we want to make me better and make my situation better. And it's always going to exist. That battle is always going to exist within us. Each of our hearts have those temptations, those lies, don't they? Don't they? And, and the way we uncover these is we simply ask questions like, you know, um, what are the ideas in your mind that um, people would think more of you if you just had fill in the blank? Or what are the things in that if you had that in your life would make you a happier person if you just had that fill in the blank? Those are the pieces that tempt us to think if we just had those things, we'd be good people, right? But if the answer isn't Christ and they fill in the blanks, we're going to find woefully over and over, they fail us. They fail us. We don't become the good people we think we could be because, verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And verse 4 follows up right after that. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Those blanks are those other gods. Those things that we believe will make us good, will give us what we want. And yet we find that, no, they don't. They don't. But listen to this. Psalm 7 picks right back up. Uh, in, in verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. Listen to this. Because he's at my right hand and I shall not be shaken. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. And my flesh also dwells secure. 
I love this is worth memorizing, especially verses 8 and 9. I have set the Lord always before me because he sat at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. And listen to this holistic picture that the psalmist gives us. You know, he, was, he was giving holistic pictures before we were using the word holistic like this fancy reality, right? He says, therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, and my flesh or my physical being also dwells secure. In other words, everything about me is joyful in the Lord. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts this verse in, uh, in his message paraphrase. He says, he says it like this. Day and night, I'll stick with God. I've got a good thing going and I'm not letting go. I'm happy from the inside out and from the outside in. Everything, everything is joyful in the Lord. My whole being. And it says, why? Well, verse 11 because you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. These are the words of somebody who understands their deepest joy is following after the Lord. That every day is an opportunity to follow God better. That as the song declares, <laughs> I am satisfied at the core in Jesus Christ. And that every day is that opportunity to be satisfied in Christ. And what do we call that? Well, we call it discipleship. It's that daily growing and understanding who Jesus is. And, and I bring all this back to what is the Bible really teaching us? Is it teaching us how to be good people? No. It's teaching us how to be faithful people. How to follow after Christ every day. And, and to look for those opportunities to follow after Christ every day. And I think in this season of COVID-19... That is so incredibly important. Um, I was just having a conversation right before this with, with Jim Turpin talking about those, those important rhythms that we have throughout our days during these kind of seasons. Because if you don't, it throws everything off. It throws everything off. Well, uh, I think understanding our days, especially in the season, as days that, the, that God is still growing our faith is so important. I, and, and the example I was thinking of when I got to this is um, it's what I would call a classic movie. Some others may not. Uh, but The Karate Kid. I love the, the first Karate Kid. That's, that's where it's at. And you perhaps remember it. And there's this great moment where Daniel, the main character, is a young man. He, he wants to learn karate from the character Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi is an older gentleman from Okinawa, Japan. And Mr. Miyagi says, well, I'm going to teach you karate, but first you've got to do some things. You've got to wax the car, right? You know, do these chores. You've got you to paint the fence. You've got to sand the floor, right? Well, as he's doing these chores, finally this moment happens in the, in the film where, where Daniel just loses it. He just gets so frustrated, and he finally just says, all you're doing is using me. You're using me to get what you want. I'm like your slave, he says. And and the moment finally breaks where Mr. Miyagi says, Daniel, son, come here, come here. And, and he does, and he gets face to face with him. And he says, show me, wax on, wax off. And he, Daniel does this really fast. He says, no, no, slower. And he, goes, and he puts his hand out. He goes, boom, and he hits his hand. He says, show me, paint the fence. Show me, sand the floor. And as Daniel shows him each one, he says, he says no, focus, concentrate on him. And then finally, he launches into this barrage of punches and kicks. And that Daniel's son does wax on and wax on. He blocks him. And then he does the paint the fence and blocks these attacks to his head. And he does sand the floor and blocks these kicks. And Mr. Miyagi looks at him and he bows. And all of a sudden, Daniel realizes every day, every day, Mr. Miyagi has been discipling him, hasn't he? Every day he's teaching him, he's showing him what it means to pursue this martial arts thing that he so longs to do. In the same way, friends, every day Jesus is pursuing us with opportunities for faith, to follow him, to grow. It starts in his word, it grows in prayer, but it really comes to fulfillment in obedience. In this season of COVID-19, what does it mean for you to see every day as an opportunity to grow in faith? 
Because that's where Scripture's taking us. It's trying to create faithful people. And friends, the reality is, is Jesus takes us there because he knows that is where we are deeply satisfied. And I think that's so important in a season like this. We need to know where our satisfaction comes from, and it comes from faith in Christ. So friends, I'm going to pray for that end for us this morning, um, that this week would be a week that we are faithful people and following after those places where Jesus is walking through us, with us throughout our day and calling us to grow as disciples. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, hallelujah. We have found you, the one our soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies our longings, every single longing, every place that we put our hearts and look for something else, we find that it was Jesus the whole time because through his blood, we are now set free. Jesus, I ask for each one of us, wh whatever we're doing this season, for those of us who are, who are going into a job that feels very depleting right now because so many things are off, for those of us who are, who are stuck at home, for those of us uh, who wish we were in school and but we're not, we're, we're doing homeschool, for those of us who are just feeling very lonely right now, I ask, Jesus, would you reveal yourself afresh this week? Would you help us to hear your beckons and your calls to follow you, not to be a good person, but to be a faithful person, a person who finds our deepest satisfaction in you and you alone. Lord, help us to follow you. Spirit, prompt us regularly and draw us into your word. We love you. We thank you for loving us first. And it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray this. Amen.